Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, we are trying out a new type of episode where Johns Hopkins experts tell us about new research papers on COVID and what they mean. First, we'll hear from Dr. Andrew Redd about a research study published in the New England Journal of Medicine about COVID-19 vaccines and whether they might work in older adults. Then I turn to Dr. Sheree Schwartz about a paper published in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, that's the CDC's journal, about the implications of COVID-19 for pregnancy. Finally, we hear from Dr. Denali Boone about a preprint paper on the potential use of rapid COVID tests. Detailed information about all three of these studies is linked in our show notes. You can read analyses of these and many other studies at the Novel Coronavirus Research Compendium or NCRC website. You can find that website at ncrc.jhsph.edu. That's ncrc.jhsph.edu. Let's listen. Dr. Red, tell us about the paper you want to discuss. Uh, thanks, Josh. Yeah, the, the paper I want to discuss is focused on answering the question of if the vaccines that have been developed or the one vaccine will generate the same immune response in older individuals as it does in younger individuals. Why is that important? So um, as as probably most people know, the, the people who are getting the most disease in COVID-19 are, are older individuals. But the problem is most vaccine trials, because they're experimental, are focused on the general population and recruit younger people, so people between the ages of 18 and 50. And so they often don't capture those older individuals. So what did the researchers do to assess how the vaccine might work in an older population? Yeah, so what the the researchers did, so this is the group who are working with the Moderna vaccine, which is one of the vaccines that is in the last stage of of testing for for general use. And what they did is they recruited a small group of people between the ages of 55 and 70. And then very critically, they also recruited people who are over the age of 70 and then gave them the vaccine as an expansion of the first phase of their trial and looked to see what their immune response was after those vaccines. And by immune response, do you mean antibodies? Yeah, so they looked at at not only the levels of antibodies that the vaccines induced in the people, but also looked at the level of T-cell responses or the white blood cell responses to the virus as well. And one of the good things about the paper is what they found is that the immune responses and antibody responses uh, in the older individuals were comparable to what you see in the younger individuals, which was the much larger trial that was done originally. So what does that mean? Uh, So what this suggests is that the vaccine, if those those immune responses that are created is protective of either the infection and or disease, is that what this suggests is that it should work in older individuals if it works in younger individuals as well. And that's obviously a big question because of that high risk that older individuals are to the disease. So this study found strong immune responses in older adults, but we're still waiting for the data to see whether those strong immune responses predict not getting COVID. Exactly. So that is what the these last stages, the phase three stages of the vaccine trials are, is to look for the efficacy of the, of the vaccine. Does it protect in infection? Or if it doesn't protect infection, does it protect people from getting disease? And those are the big questions um, that these large trials are trying to answer and hopefully we'll answer soon. So promising evidence that if this vaccine works, it'll work for older adults. Does that translate to other vaccines? Uh, not necessarily. It's, it should 
translate to other vaccines, but it's not always the case that that if it works in young people, it may it will work in older people, and that's just because of the 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 way that their immune systems react to different vaccines. But this is really positive evidence for these mRNA based vaccines, like the one Moderna makes. And I just want to add that this week, the Pfizer group also put out a paper that showed in older individuals similar antibody levels and T-cell responses in older individuals as well, which is a nice sort of support that these types of vaccines may work well regardless of the age. Great. Well, thank you so much for explaining all that. Oh, you're welcome. Dr. Schwartz, thanks for joining me. Tell me about the study you've been thinking about. Yeah, thanks, Josh, for having us. Uh, I'm going to talk about a paper that the NCRC recently highlighted related to COVID-19 outcomes amongst pregnant women and their babies. And just to say that, you know, this is something that's of interest because we know that pregnancy alters the immune system. And we know from a variety of other infectious diseases, Zika, malaria, HIV, that uh, pregnant women who experience an infection can have worse outcomes. Got it. So what did the paper show? So this paper uh, used surveillance data from from 13 states in in the U.S., and these were all hospitalizations of individuals um, who had COVID. Many weren't in the hospital because they had COVID, and they took from that 600 pregnant women, and they saw that of those pregnant women uh, who had tested positive for the coronavirus, about 55 percent, just over half, were actually asymptomatic. But amongst those who were symptomatic, they saw uh, more severe health outcomes. And so specifically, they saw that 16% of those women who were symptomatic and pregnant required intensive care uh, unit bed. Uh, About 8.5% required a mechanical ventilator. So we saw some relatively severe COVID cases amongst those pregnant women who were symptomatic. What about deaths? So that was some good news, is that overall, uh, less than 1% of of the cases resulted in maternal death. And, you know, that was, you know, true even amongst the most severe cases. So that was good news. Uh, In terms of pregnancy loss, though, we did see amongst the severe cases uh, relatively high rates of pregnancy loss. So that certainly is something uh, to be thinking about. 5% of the pregnant women who had severe cases did experience pregnancy loss. And and this is important because these were primarily women uh, quite far along in their pregnancies in the third trimester. So are these rates both of severe illness in pregnant women and pregnancy loss higher than you would expect for people who didn't have COVID? Amongst the amongst those women who were symptomatic, yes, um, they are higher than what we would uh, expect to see amongst women who who don't have COVID. And I think what you know what we see in these data um, and other data that have been published recently, which we've also highlighted in the NCRC, is that there are some pretty consistent trends with the population overall. So women who are of um, who are older um, during their pregnancy fare worse. Those who uh, have hypertension, diabetes. Uh, obesity. Again, those women fare worse, just like we're seeing at the population level. And again, racial disparities also persist. So some of these same drivers and factors that uh, the population uh, that is causing poor outcomes in the population at whole are amplified during pregnancy as well. Got it. Got it. So what I meant to say, and I think you answered the right question, is that the outcomes were worse uh, in people who are pregnant, but the birth outcomes were worse than people who didn't have COVID. Yes. Yeah. We see that the that the birth outcomes were, you know, the 5% pregnancy loss in third trimester amongst um, amongst symptomatic women is quite high. So that that certainly is worse. What we aren't really seeing are a lot of birth defects so far in the data. This, this study didn't particularly cover that. But, you know, that is a silver lining uh, as well that we are seeing that, you know, not many birth defects so far, some transmissions to babies. um, But overall, those seem to be mild cases. So I think we still don't have enough data there, but a little bit more um, optimism on that front. What about data on long term effects for babies that are exposed uh, to COVID? Yeah, so I think this is still one of the things that we don't have a lot of data on yet and that we still um, we still need to learn more about. So what are the long term 
cardiac, respiratory, um, neurodevelopmental effects that, that babies will experience, we don't really know. And when you think about how long um, the pandemic has been with us, we don't have a lot of data from babies that were exposed during the first trimester of pregnancy, right? So it's been a very long year for all of us, but you know, it's still been about nine or 10 months. So we should just start seeing some um, outcomes, some data soon from women in the US who were infected with uh, the coronavirus, had COVID-19 early in pregnancy. And that's important because a lot of, um, you know, a lot of development and a lot of birth defects uh, are experienced early in pregnancy. Great. Well, thank you so much for explaining all that to us. Thanks for having me. Dr. Boone, thank you so much for joining me too. And I'm looking forward to hearing about the paper that you picked. Yeah, thanks for having us. So the paper I wanted to talk about today, it's a preprint. It was posted on one of the preprint servers on October 5th, and it's looking at if a rapid test could better identify infectious or contagious individuals in a population compared to our gold standard PCR tests. So the PCR test is the one that, you know, you put up your nose, um, then it goes to the lab, maybe for a few hours, but in many cases for a few days, and sometimes for a week or even longer. Whereas a rapid test, how long does that take to get the result? Yeah, so some of the rapid tests can take as little as 15 minutes. I think the longest ones are taking about 45 minutes, but on average, they're much, much faster. And you can get them at at a place where you access your healthcare. So the PCR tests have to be sent to that lab, um, whereas these rapid tests can be done at a pharmacy and you can get those results right there. So there have been questions about the rapid tests in terms of their accuracy. So how does this paper add to that discussion? Yeah, so this paper uh, basically looked at, they identified 38 samples that were PCR positive um, from individuals who were symptomatic uh, with COVID. They had symptoms for less than eight days. And they took those samples and they tested them with the rapid test to see how that compared. And then they also looked at if these samples could infect cells in the lab. And what they found was that the antigen test identified 29 of those 38 PCR positive samples as antigen positive. So that's about 76%. And that's very consistent with what we've been seeing with these antigen tests and sort of what you've described that they haven't been detecting as many infections as the PCR tests. Um, So what they further did was among those 38 PCR positive samples, They then tried to infect cells in the lab, and 28 of those samples could infect cells in the lab. Those samples that were able to infect cells had more virus in them than the samples that couldn't infect cells in the lab. So then they wanted to see how many of those samples that had been able to infect cells in the lab could also be detected by that antigen test. And so of those 28 samples that infected cells in the lab, 27 of them could be detected by that antigen test. So that's 96%. And again, those samples had more RNA in them, more virus than the samples that couldn't. And so they took this one step farther and they looked at something that epidemiologists call positive predictive value. And so in this case, that would be the probability that the sample is infectious to those cells, given that you got a positive test result. And so for the antigen test, for example, they got a positive predictive value of 90%. And so this would mean that the probability that your sample was infectious to the cells was 90% if you got a positive test. And they compared that to PCR, which only had a 73% positive predictive value. Right. Well, I want to ask you a few questions about this, because if one of the purposes of the test is to make sure you're catching all the people who could be infectious, the PCR test is still a little bit better if that's all you wanted to do, because it sounds like the antigen test uh, relatively does better for infectious patients than it does for all patients but still it missed one of them in the sample. Is that right? So it did, it did. And I think it's really important to also point out that these were only symptomatic patients. And so, and we also know that they had higher viral loads. And so when we're looking at that pre-symptomatic period, so before people become symptomatic, but we know that they're infectious, the antigen test might not perform well in that time period. We also don't know how this would look in asymptomatic people. And we know that about 40% of our cases are asymptomatic. And we also know those people have been transmitting. And so that it doesn't replace PCR tests. 
Well, this study doesn't really say anything about patients without symptoms. No, it doesn't. We don't know anything about patients without symptoms from this study. And for patients with symptoms, it says that, you know, the antigen test may seem like it's really not that good at all at 76% of the cases, but you can get a higher number if you're really looking for the cases that are more likely to be infectious. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think that the utility of this study and what they're suggesting might be beneficial from a public health intervention sort of standpoint is that if our goal is to identify people who are the most infectious and isolate them, that this could be a good utility to do that in a rapid way. So perhaps if you test negative, you still need to have, by an antigen test, perhaps you still need to have a follow-up PCR test to make sure that you're not infectious, but it's a good way to go in and pull very infectious people out of the population so that we can isolate them more quickly if you can get a result in 15 minutes compared to a week. They're also much cheaper tests and they're easier to produce and mass scale up. So they might be better um, we might be better to, able to have them available to people. So this might have a role really in a doctor's office to quickly tell somebody you're, you know, very, very likely to have COVID, even if we're going to send off a test to be sure. Yes, that's correct. And neither, you know, neither of these tests have a lot of false positives. There are false positives where if you test positive, you may not actually be infected, but that's much more rare than the alternative, which is those missed positive cases. So I think if you do get one of these tests in a doctor's office, you may not need to send your sample off for confirmation for PCR if it's positive. It's only the converse to that. Yeah. Got it. Although, um, that analysis might be a little different for people without symptoms. This is really talking about people with symptoms. It is. And these tests, these rapid tests have actually only been tested in people with symptoms and they're, they're um, authorized for use among people with symptoms. Great. Good. Well, thank you so much for uh, walking us through that interesting preprint study. Sure. Thanks for having us. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. Thank you.